Welcome back to the table today. Ryan and I are going to give you a look, preview if you will, of a game called Fabled the Spirit Lands. This one is from Crowd Games and again, another unique game on the table. It does some stuff that I've not seen in terms of how you get your points. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, those points are not plentiful. You're oh, going to squeak out points here and there to not, win the you're game. You're not getting a ton of points. And this game is about taking a journey through the Spirit Lands. You're going to be moving across a map that's ever changing. So a lot like the Fairylands. And you'll see we've kind of got the board set up here mid progress, but you'll see the, the main uh, play area is centered around this map. And this is not a map that is stagnant. This map is going to be changing throughout the course of the game. We're going to be putting our sages on here, moving these sages around and taking actions at specific locations, all in the service of gaining knowledge from this fairy world or this fabled world. And this knowledge comes in the form of books. A large part of the game is getting books and then using them to pay for things or eventually finding ways to turn these books into points, which yeah. hopefully you'll be able to do by the end of the game. Basically converting them up the book tree, if you yeah. will. What we have here on the table is the game in progress, so to speak. This is a prototype, but what we have here are all of these cards here that are going to make up this map. We've got the prairies, the mountains, and the forests, and then some ally cards here, which will not come down here. They're going to come to your player space throughout the game. Everyone's going to start with one, and then throughout different parts of the game, you're going to get maybe up to three. And these give you some ongoing powers or some things that affect your game and your game yeah. only that let you manipulate some things. We've also got here, this is the round tracker, and this is going to have different things that happen at different times. Different times meaning there are scenarios that might change this up in terms of how the game plays out. We also have some event cards that flip over at different times during the game. And then those books that Ryan was talking about. There's ones associated with the forest, the mountains, the prairies, and then these ones here are the sun. Yeah, the books of sun. The books of sun. These are the points. These are what you want at the end of the game. If you don't have any books of sun, you have zero points. Yeah, there's a, a whole lot going on here as far as how to get those points, but the basic premise is a conversion factor. Yes. You're always trying to convert your books up to the next level, and they kind of go in cascading order. You've got your the prairie, the mountain, and the forest, and part of the game, you can turn in two books of one kind for a book of the next higher value. Now, the real trick is finding actions that give you a better conversion rate yeah. or give you more conversions, but you're also spending these books to add map cards out into this tableau, and you'll see here the sages moving down these paths. So, on your turn, you're kind of just doing one of four things, and three of these things are kind of like utility actions. You can yes. move a guy one space, you can just grab two of the very basic prairie books if you need one, or you can convert, which is not a great conversion rate, but if you really need to get some points at the end or you don't really have anything else to do, you can convert. But the main thing you're doing on your turn, like the big action, yeah. is adding these location cards to the map. Yeah, and to take that action, you're literally just going to take one of these map cards and add it to this. Now, you can take the ones that are face up or you can take the ones from the top of the deck, but whichever one you take, you might have to pay for it. If it's the first card of its type, say if it's the first prairie down here, it's just going to take one prairie book. But you have to take a look at all the cards down here. As you can see, we have two forests. So if we wanted to add a forest, it's going to cost the one forest book, but then one prairie book for each additional forest yeah. there. So you got to take that into consideration. Now these map cards are going to be added not just to the beginning and the end, but they can be slotted in between cards as well. So keep that in mind because some of these cards will connect some of them might not. Yeah. So depending on where you might have your sages, you might want to consider, oh, I'm going to add this card right after the card where I already have sages so that they can continue on the path. Keeping in mind, some of those paths even dead end at the right hand side of the card. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons that you're going to want to choose specific cards because for one, every time you add a new card into the row, you're going to put one of your sages on the first space. So first of all, that's a way to get more sages on the board. If you do it right, these sages might even follow paths that go across multiple cards on their journey. However, your opponent might play a card or separate cards or whatever, if you had a really good path, they might break that path up or they might create a better path for themselves to move from one card to another because you effectively want to keep your sages out in the game as long as possible. Every time they can't move, they reach the end of, the, of a card or they reach a dead end, they have to come back to your supply. You have to get a new card out to place them. Because like I said, one of the things you could do in your turn if you're not playing a location card is just to move one space. 
And that movement, it doesn't seem significant, it's just one space. It can help. But you're trying to get your guys to move as much as possible because spread out across these cards are these different fabled locations where if you move to them, you get to actually take a very specific action. And there are a ton of these different fabled locations. But I would say figuring out those combos of like hitting up these actions is really kind of the core strategy of the game. Yeah, and these actions, we won't go through the entire list, but they do all sorts of things that you might expect. A lot of them will just get you some books of different mm -hmm. colors. Some of them will give you some of those conversions that we were talking about at a better rate. Yep. You might be able to take four conversions that are a little bit better of a conversion than you typically would, or maybe just one conversion of a really better conversion Yeah, sometimes rate. some even let you skip a tier and go yeah. up to the next tier, which is really good. And that's important because you basically want to keep climbing up that chart using your yellows to go to blues, to greens, and then to reds ultimately, because if you don't end up with any reds, like I said, you don't have any points. Right. Right, and that conversion is important, but it's also important to keep some books of smaller denominations because you might need to pay for those locations to come out as you do. Now, the cool thing about planning out your locations, and there's another reason why you might decide to put a specific location out. After you've done your action, so you get one action and then you're done. Then you move on to the second phase of your turn, which is the movement phase. In this phase, you pick a terrain type. So I could say forest, and everybody in the forest moves. So that means your opponents move as well as you do. That's why it's more expensive to add more, but you might find yourself in a good position if you've got a bunch of figures on a bunch of forest spaces, you can move them all at once. You move every single one of your guys two spaces and every opponent moves one space. This might mean that you end up on one of those places of uh, the fabled places and then get to take those actions it might mean that your opponents end up on those fabled yeah. spaces as well and get to take those actions, but that's gonna kind of push things forward. So you wanna kind of build out, if you think your opponent is doing a lot of mountain movement, maybe you wanna put a mountain card out just to get some people, and you'll notice the mountains have two paths. Maybe you want the mountain because you think they're gonna do that, but then they see that you put a mountain out, so they decide not to call for mountains. It's kind of a, a guessing game of, of what you think the opponents are gonna do there. Yeah, you're gonna to wanna to keep looking at the map cards that are up to determine which ones you want to add and considering all those variables one other vari variable that you might want to consider are the ally cards that you have yeah. i started with the rock titan this is just an example of what an ally does but this card says when you declare movement in mountains i got to move my sages an additional space so that gave me one more reason to move in mountains so that i could move three spaces because you can really get quite far and tap some of those locations. Now, yeah. you're never going to be using one sage to activate more than one fabled location in any given turn. Sure, yeah, you move into the fabled location and that stops your movement effectively. But it's these sorts of things that can really help and there's all sorts of different allies. And then each ally also has a bottom section of the card that can be unlocked at a certain point in the game depending on the scenario you're playing. Yeah, that, yeah. and that scenario setup, like David alluded to earlier, is completely random, or not random, I guess I should say it's completely variable. Yeah. Every scenario is gonna have a different set of these counters that come out and these are going to tell you a few things. They're going to tell you, first of all, when the game ends. They're going to tell you when to draw event cards. And they're going to tell you when to draw new allies. At the start of the game, like he said, you get one ally card. You're going to have a space where you can unlock a second ally card. And then from then on, you've got some tokens that are either going to give you another ally or unlock the secondary feature on your ally card. So your allies can get more powerful. So you could end up with just two allies that are max power, or you could potentially end up with four allies that only just have one power each. So all of that is gonna be changed based on the scenario setup, as well as these event cards. Now, event cards come in a few levels. You're gonna see these different feathers that correspond. It, it tells you kind of what to do on the event card. But another interesting thing here is that there are many different decks of event cards. When you're setting up a particular scenario, you're choosing an event deck to pair with that scenario, so the events are always going to be different. It's not gonna be the same combination of scenario and event every time you play. Yeah, and they're gonna have this, the kind of effects you'd expect in terms of affecting the game and some of your decisions. For instance, this one, Fair Wind, suggests that during the first two events, if it's taking place then, during your action phase, if you take that move action where you're just moving one sage, one space, you're able to move a little bit further, which is a significant impact yeah, because really that does. one movement sometimes feels just like a little bit, although it can be helpful. Moving it two can be very beneficial. It could get you exactly the spaces you need to get to that next uh, 
location. Yeah. And this is definitely a game that scales as you play because you kind of start off with just one location with one sage that you're moving around. But as you can see, as you go on, you start to put more and more locations out, meaning you get more of your sages out. When we played, I had all seven of my sages out on the board, which means you're moving a lot more. You're finding some locations that even give extra movement so you can start moving people that weren't. So there's a lot of different combos and synergies that you can find across this map. And that's why they do give you some of these face up options because you say, oh, well, I'm getting close to the end of this path. Oh, but I can place this one here and I can actually continue on now, hopefully getting the most points by the end of the game. Yeah, you gotta look for those conversion locations yeah. on the cards while they last. Because one thing I don't think we mentioned is these cards too will leave this map. This map is not ever growing. As soon as someone leaves a card and there's no more sages on that card, that card will be removed and basically taken out of that game. Yeah. So it's going to reduce the number of spaces and some of the locations. Now some of these locations let you take the action of any other location on the, the map. Yeah. So if you take a key conversion location out of the equation, it might be the one thing that keeps the other player from utilizing Right, that. you really need to consider that when you're about to be the one that moves off of a card. And there yeah. are some ways with allies and events that you could potentially restart and add a new sage back onto a card that you've already been on. But generally, the only way to get onto a card is to be the one to play it or to have moved there from another card. So there is a lot of timing that goes into this. Uh -huh. There's a lot of planning that you really need to do that you're probably not going to be great at your first time. But the more you play it, the more you'll start to see uh, be able to value maybe how beneficial some of these actions are. Yeah, it's very puzzling. And in fact, we didn't play the solo game, but there is a pretty robust rule set yeah. for the solo play. And cooperative. Solo and or cooperative. cooperative. And I, I do think this gameplay, even in the competitive mode, we can see how this lends itself well to that sort of puzzly yeah. gameplay that you'd expect in a co-op or a solo. So take that into consideration too. But if you have any questions at all about the game, please make them in the comments below. We'll get down there answer whatever we possibly can. Yeah. Until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then.